Mr. Chairman and Brethren of the Vow, in whatever the vow is, for although I have been a member of this club for five and twenty years, I don't know any more about what that vow is than Mr. Austin seems to. But whatever the vow is, I don't care what it is, I have made a thousand vows. There is no pleasure comparable to making a vow in the presence of one who appreciates that vow, in the presence of men who honor and appreciate you for making the vow, and men who admire you for making the vow. There is only one pleasure higher than that, and that is to get outside and break the vow. A vow is always a pledge of some kind or other for the protection of your own morals and principles or somebody else's. And generally, by the irony of fate, it is for the protection of your own morals. Hence, we have pledges that make us eschew tobacco or wine. And while you are taking the pledge, there is a holy influence about that makes you feel you are reformed, and that you can never be so happy again in this world until you get outside and take a drink. I had forgotten that I was a member of this club. It is so long ago. But now I remember that I was here five and twenty years ago and that I was then at a dinner of the White Friars Club and it was in those old days when you had just made two great finds. All London was talking about nothing else than that they had found Livingstone and that the lost Sir Roger Tickborn had been found. And they were trying him for it. And at the dinner, Chairman, I do not know who he was, failed to come to time. The gentleman who had been appointed to pay me the customary compliments and to introduce me forgot the compliments and did not know what they were. And George Augustus Sala came in at the last moment just when I was about to go without compliments altogether. And that man was a gifted man. They just called on him instantaneously while he was going to sit down to introduce the stranger, and Sala made one of those marvelous speeches which he is capable of making. I think no man talked so fast as Sala did. One did not need wine while he was making a speech. The rapidity of his utterance made a man drunk in a minute. An incomparable speech was that, an impromptu speech, and an impromptu speech is a seldom thing, and he did it so well. He went into the whole history of the United States and made it entirely new to me. He filled it with episodes and incidents that Washington never heard of, and he did it so convincingly that, although I knew none of it had happened, from that day to this, I do not know any history but Salas. I do not know anything so sad as a dinner where you are going to get up and say something by and by, and you do not know what it is. You sit and wonder and wonder what the gentleman is going to say who is going to introduce you. You know that if he says something severe... That if he will deride you or traduce you or do anything of that kind, he will furnish you with a text, because anybody can get up and talk against that. Anybody can get up and straighten out his character, but when a gentleman gets up and merely tells the truth about you, what can you do? Mr. Austin has done well. He has supplied so many texts that I will have to drop out a lot of them, and that is about as difficult as when you do not have any text at all. Now, 
He made a beautiful and smooth speech without any difficulty at all, and I could have done that if I had gone on with the schooling with which I began. I see here a gentleman on my left who was my master in the art of oratory more than twenty-five years ago. When I look upon the inspiring face of Mr. Depew, it carries me a long way back. An old and valued friend of mine is he, and I saw his career as it came along, and it has reached pretty well up to now, when he, by another miscarriage of justice, is a United States senator. But those were delightful days when I was taking lessons in oratory. My other master, the ambassador, is not here yet. Under those two gentlemen, I learned to make after-dinner speeches, and it was charming. You know that Eng New England dinner is the great occasion on the other side of the water. It is held every year to celebrate the landing of the pilgrims. Those pilgrims were a lot of people who were not needed in England, and you know they had great rivalry, and they were persuaded to go elsewhere. And they chartered a ship called Mayflower and set sail, and I have heard it said that they pumped the Atlantic Ocean through that ship sixteen times. They fell in over there with the Dutch from Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and... A lot of other places with profane names, and it is from that gang that Mr. Depew is descended. On the other hand, Mr. Choate is descended from those Puritans who landed on a bitter night in December. Every year those people used to meet at a great banquet in New York, and those masters of mind and oratory had to make speeches. It was Dr. Depew's business to get up there and apologize for the Dutch. And Mr. Choate had to get up later and explain the crimes of the Puritans and grand, beautiful times we used to have. It is curious that after that long lapse of time, I meet the White Friars again, some looking as young and fresh as in the old days. Others showing a certain amount of wear and tear, and here, after all this time, I find one of the masters of oratory and the others named in the list. And here we three meet again as exiles on one pretext or another, and you will notice that while we are absent, there is a pleasing and tranquility in America a building up of public confidence. We are doing the best we can for our country. I think we have spent our lives in serving our country, and we never serve it to greater advantage than when we get out of it. But impromptu speaking, that is what I was trying to learn. That is a difficult thing. I used to do it in this way. I used to begin about a week ahead and write out my impromptu speech and get it by heart. Then I brought it to the New England dinner, printed on a piece of paper in my pocket, so that I could pass it to the reporters all cut and dried, and in order to do an impromptu speech as it should be done, you have to indicate the places for pauses and hesitations. I put them all in it. And then you want the applause in the right places. When I got to the place where it should come in, if it did not come in, I did not care, but I had it marked on the paper. And these masters of mine used to wonder why it was my speech came out in the morning in the first person, while theirs went through the butchery of synopsis. I do that kind of speech, I mean, an offhand speech and do it well, and make no mistake, in such a way to deceive the audience completely and make that audience believe it is an impromptu speech. That is art. I was frightened out of it at last by an experience of Dr. Hayes. 
He was a sort of Nansen of that day. He had been to the North Pole, and it made him celebrated. He had even seen the polar bear climb the pole. He had made one of those magnificent voyages such as Nansen made, and in those days, when a man did anything which greatly distinguished him for the moment, he had to come on to the lecture platform and tell all about it. Dr. Hayes was a great, magnificent creature like Nansen, superbly built. He was to appear in Boston. He wrote his lecture out, and it was his purpose to read it from manuscript. But in an evil hour, he concluded that it would be a good thing to preface it with something rather handsome, poetical, and beautiful that he could get off by heart and deliver as if it were the thought of the moment. He had not had my experience and could not do that. He came on the platform, held his manuscript down, and began with a beautiful piece of oratory. He spoke something like this. When a lonely human being, a pygmy in the midst of the architecture of nature, stands solitary on those icy waters and looks abroad to the horizon, and sees mighty castles and temples of eternal ice, raising up their pinnacles tipped by the pencil of the departing sun. Here a man came across the platform and touched him on the shoulder and said, One minute, and then to the audience. Is Mrs. John Smith in the house? Her husband has slipped on the ice and broken his leg. And you could see the Mrs. John Smiths get up everywhere and drift out of the house, and it made great gaps everywhere. Then Dr. Hayes began again. When a lonely man, a pygmy in the architecture, the janitor came in and shouted, It is not Mrs. John Smith, it is Mrs. John Jones. Then all the Mrs. Joneses got up and left. Once more, the speaker started and was in the midst of the sentence when he was interrupted again, and the result was that the lecture was not delivered. But the lecturer interviewed the janitor afterward in a private room, and of the fragments of that janitor, they took twelve baskets full. Now, I don't want to sit down just in this way. I have been talking with so much levity that I have said no serious thing, and you are really no better or wiser, although Robert Buchanan has suggested that I am a person who deals in wisdom. I have said nothing which would make you better than when you came here. I should be sorry to sit down without having said one serious word which you can carry home and relate to your children and the old people who are not able to get away. And this is just a little maxim which has saved me from many a difficulty and many a disaster, and in times of tribulation and uncertainty has come to my rescue, as it shall to yours if you observe it as I do day and night. I always use it in an emergency, and you can take it home as a legacy from me, and it is... When in doubt, tell the truth. <laughs>